Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. I am delighted to introduce you to Dmitry Alperovich, founder and CTO of CrowdStrike, a leading uh, security company with market cap of over $84 billion. He's a gentleman of Silverado Policy Accelerator. And um, most interestingly for today, uh, as discussion, he is a national best-selling author uh, of a book called World Under the Brink. Uh, Dimitri, welcome to the pod. Thanks so much for having me. Well, um, I am so impressed with the range of your accomplishments, starting from uh, being an entrepreneur, uh, but having come from an immigrant to the U.S. Uh, background and having achieved tremendous success, all the way to now really changing the mindset of our foreign policy establishment, ringing the bells in a very similar way uh, in which uh, George Kennan's long telegram uh, set up a policy for containment uh, during the uh, Cold War I. You're introducing that during Cold War II. We'll come back to that in a second, because I think the reason you're getting these insights and the reason uh, you have the credibility in shaking things up in our establishment, it actually comes from that journey uh, uh, as an entrepreneur. So let's dive into that and tell us, you know, how did you get into the information security as it was called back then? And, uh, um, and what was the insight about adversarial um, threats uh, that really undermined the success of CrowdStrike and beyond? Sure. Well, thanks so much for having me. So, so I've been involved in the cybersecurity industry really since high school. Um, I got into it a little bit by accident because my dad uh, got interested. He had a applied mathematics background in the Soviet Union. He got interested in encryption and elliptic curve cryptography back in the early to mid nineties. And, uh, I ended up helping him out. Um, and, uh, we, we even started a small company together when I was still in high school. And, uh, you know, it was in the subset of the overall cybersecurity space that is encryption. Uh, but, uh, I very quickly realized that, um, there's a inherent appeal of this whole space to me, uh, primarily because I love chess and these adversarial games and cybersecurity is very much that that you're not facing sort of a, uh you're, you're facing a sentient opponent you're not facing just you know nature or uh you know trying to just solve a problem that exists and once you solve it you're done in cyber you're never done because of course as long as there are bad people out there that wish to do harm they're going to find a way to do that so that cat and mouse game I found really, really interesting and intellectually stimulating. So I ended up going to college uh, and and focusing on that and being actually the first graduate out of Georgia Tech with a master's degree in what was then called information security. And after that, went into startup world and uh, ultimately, uh, about a decade later, ended up of um, founding, co-founding this company called CrowdStrike because uh, uh, I ended up finding that there was a big problem inside cybersecurity industry that was not being paid attention to, which is nation state attacks. And uh, initially from China, but then Russia, Iran, North Korea, uh, they were breaking into private companies for espionage purposes, for stealing of secrets and uh, uh, intellectual property. And, and later on also uh, um, doing disruptive and, and destructive attacks. And at the time, and I'm just going to time... pause you for a second. I'm going to share one of your quotes, uh, which I found particularly interesting as we we're doing research. This is from a few years later when you were at Silverado, uh, quoting yourselves. We do not have a cyber problem. We have a China, Russia, Iran and North Korea problem. And it sounds like that's something that is not just a recent discovery, right? That it was a foundational to what was behind the crowd strike. Success. Yeah, I actually I don't remember the exact date, but it was in the early 2010s, just as about uh, as we were launching CrowdStrike that I coined that because I, I appreciated that this was not just going to be solved through cyber and that geopolitics was at the root of of this evolving problem. Uh, and uh, even if you look at the range of threat actors you see in cyberspace, both nation states and criminals and uh, kind of hacktivist threat actors, uh, a lot of a lot of them um, are coming from these four countries: Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. Uh, 
not because they have a monopoly on all cyber activity, offensive cyber activity, but simply mm -hmm. because they either don't enforce or even in many cases encourage their non-state actors to um, go after Western businesses, Western governments, uh, because they find that to be helpful in their overall uh, confrontation with the West. Um, so we certainly have cyber criminals in America. We have cyber criminals in Europe, but they tend to get arrested. They tend to have a fairly short lifespan in that career. Uh, but it is the criminals that are outside of our jurisdiction, outside of the uh, our ability to bring them to justice mm. that tend to become the most prolific and, and most dangerous. And then, of course, you've got the nation states and these four are the primary nation state actors. So geopolitics was always at the root of cyber, at least for the last 15 plus years. And, um, you know, that that was part of the incentives for starting CrowdStrike is realizing that this was only going to get worse. And what else would you attribute the success of CrowdStrike? It's, it's you know, obviously cyber is a huge problem in part some of the reasons you're explaining you know, be, what, what's behind that, but what else was behind um, in, the, the, in, the original insight, was, like which part of it was execution, which part, you know, earlier we talked about being competitive and wanting to win. Um, it is a, you know, it is a remarkable story uh, at the pace um, of growth and, you know, in the place where there were a lot of established competitors already. Yeah, you, you know, a lot of things have to go right to have a huge success. Um, timing is really, really key to this, that we started just as this whole, what was known as APT, Advanced Persistent Threat, which is really a euphemism for nation state actors, was exploding and, and no one was really focused on it. Um, at the same time, you had the established companies, McAfee and Symantec, and I actually was at McAfee mm -hmm. uh, before starting CrowdStrike, that were really in the process of dying. There was these dinosaurs that were um, that had been around for three decades that um, uh, were kind of coming down under their own weight and bureaucracy, could not innovate. I mean, originally before starting CrowdStrike, I wanted to do some of the these ideas at McAfee, you know, mm. my employer, and uh, there was just no interest in, in uh, the company uh, pursuing that. And, uh, you know, being a public company, it was very hard to invest in innovation because you kind of lived quarter by quarter. And one day you would get resources, the next day it would be taken away from you because they needed to make sure that the numbers still look good for Wall Street. And that was just not conducive to innovation, to investment. And um, as a result, uh, we were able to succeed um, and ultimately replace um, uh, these companies. McAfee and Symantec are now long gone. Um, but uh, at the time when we started the company, they were the main threats to us uh, from a business perspective. Got it. And when you look um, at your engagement with the government, right, both um, in the McAfee or like the Operation Aurora that, that you started, when, when did you feel that you were going to get involved actively in the policy um, policy work that you're doing right now? Is it kind of always obvious to you that this is something that you wanted to be a part of did, as you were kind of tackling this problem? You realize, hey, why are we the only ones that are really understanding these problems or tackling them? You know, we need to help. Was it kind of just you felt a call? Is it just intellectual curiosity? I'm really curious because as an entrepreneur, like that's really sophisticated in technology, kind of oftentimes normal path would be just stay in technology, do another, you know, deeply technical um, uh, startup and continue innovating that way. You've really, I think, uh, obviously bring that technical expertise as a CTO of CrowdStrike, but you're, you know, spreading into the communications world, right? And kind of how to persuade and you know and drive policy decisions. What was behind that? Yeah, I mean, like you, I've always had passion for international relations, foreign policy, and, and also at the end of the day, I was focused on solving the problem. And I guess I had an appreciation that technology was never sufficient. Uh, mm. it, it was often a necessary component, but it was not enough. And uh, this passion for working with the government really started very early on, um, right out of college as I was uh, joining a startup that, that was focused on email security uh, and working for a gentleman named Jay Chaudhry that went on to, to found another huge company, Zscaler, um, 
a uh, huge success story uh, in cybersecurity. Um, and I was sort of focused at the time on the spam problem and phishing attacks <clears throat> and ended up working with law enforcement, with the FBI and others in trying to track down hackers in Russia that were uh, responsible for a lot of this activity. So even before my focus on countries and nation states, I was interested in figuring out how we can help the United States and our allies in, in uh, going after uh, this issue, not just from a technical perspective, but from a policy and law enforcement perspective. And then that just got amplified as the nation state activity uh, became more and more prominent uh, in 2010. As you mentioned, I was leading the investigation that I ended up calling Operation Aurora, which was the hack of Google and uh, about two dozen other companies across the technology, defense, agriculture, and um, many other industries uh, where the Chinese were stealing intellectual property, were trying to uh, also harass activists, Tibetan activists, and, and others that are opposed to the Chinese regime. <clears throat> and that ended up getting me much more involved in Washington, ended up later moving to D.C. and, and working closely with a number of government agencies um, and uh, focused on policy. Got it. And, and so let's Kind of take that policy, policy wonk uh, war view right now that um, you have, and you know, let's dive in into Cold uh, War Two and start. Let's start with your famous prediction of uh, of the unfortunate situation in Ukraine uh, with the Russian invasion a few months before um, before the um, the actual event. We'll you know we'll share the tweet uh, that you've. Uh, uh, you, you've produced that had uh, quite a lot of uh, views, uh, you know, in the in the episode later. But what what was uh, driving that insight for you? Um, was it connecting the dots uh, from general perspective? Also having an insight, having lived through the history of uh, Cold War One, so to speak, right? Having you know been you know educated already in the in the USSR for part of your time, having had the connection and pattern matching that provided a clearer insight than many other uh, folks had about what's gonna happen uh, with the invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, um, thanks for, uh, for asking that question. So back in kind of early December, I had become convinced that Putin was not just bluffing as he was trying to mobilize his forces on the borders of Ukraine, uh, about three months before the actual invasion took place in February 24th. And uh, I, I became convinced, um, having followed him very closely over the last 25 years, his writings, his speeches, that he was really serious this time and that mm -hmm. he was going to take this action. And there were five reasons that I thought were driving him towards um, invasion. Um, and, and by the way, those five reasons are the same reasons that I think that uh, Xi Jinping wants to invade Taiwan. And they have to do with, first and foremost, history um, and a distorted view of history that both of these men have. Uh, you know, in the case of Putin, he thinks that Ukraine is not a nation, that um, they're just uh, an offshoot of the Russians and right. um, uh, they should not exist as a country. And it's an aberration of history that they were allowed to exist. He blames Lenin for creating the Soviet Union uh, and the sort of the exit treaty of the Soviet Union that allowed these republics to separate um, out of the Soviet Union. <clears throat> he also uh, believes in both his personal and Russia's destiny to unify these lands that uh, had once belonged to the Russian Empire. He sees himself famously, and as he has compared himself several times to Peter the Great, uh, the, the czar of Russia that has expanded the Russian empire, uh, and was actually the first emperor, um, of Russia. And, uh, he, uh, wants, uh, of course, to expand Russian lands, or at least retake what he th feels are rightful Russian lands and, and Ukraine is first and foremost in his mind. Uh, but there is also security and a geographic reason for, um, one in Ukraine that actually transcends Putin and is something that, has uh, found broad support ac across the uh, Russian political spectrum for a long time. Um, and that is uh, both a defensive and an offensive way to look at Ukraine. Um, from a defensive perspective, um, Russia has, of course, 
whether numerous invasions from Europe mm -hmm. over over centuries, whether it's Hitler, whether it's Napoleon, Teutonic Knights, the the Poles, and and many others. And uh, a number of those invasions have gone through Ukraine on their way to Moscow. And Ukraine, being a huge country, has given Russia that strategic depth to allow to themselves to mobilize and prepare for the defense of the capital um, while um, fighting uh, on Ukrainian lands. But also from an offensive perspective, Ukraine is a window into Europe. It borders Poland, it borders Slovakia. Um, and uh, if you want to project power into Europe, you also want to uh, have leverage over Ukraine. So as he was looking at NATO uh, flirtations from, from Ukraine, even though it wasn't about to join NATO, uh, he was seeing it sort of uh, fall further and further away from his grasp. And that was motivating some of the timing uh, for invasion because he thought that if he, he didn't do something soon, uh, he would lose Ukraine forever. And, and that brings us to the fifth and probably the most important uh, cause of the conflict, and that is ego. Um, he wanted to take credit for this. He wanted to this, for this to be done on his watch. It wasn't enough to say, well, some future leader of Russia will, will finish this off and uh, we can afford to wait uh, for a long time um, and use sort of gray zone tactics and the like to try to yeah. bring Ukraine into our fold. Um, he wanted to... Um, to do it himself. And, and by the way, the same reason, uh, is, I believe, is driving Xi to try to invade Taiwan in his own lifetime. And exactly. it's not an accident that both men are now in their 70s. So, so that we'll come back to Xi and, and your prediction that the way we started the book, that the invention is going to happen in 2028. And it's kind of really interestingly connected to the timing uh, that, that you've mentioned. But um, let's let's kind of compare notes on one other person that you probably don't love, but who has predicted that something similar would happen to what has happened. That's John Mearsheimer. So he's used much more uh, a single lens through which he looked at um, uh, uh, at at the events, right? Great power uh, politics view and the you know the power struggle, and he um, you know. He, without looking into Putin's personality and ego and some of these other things that you've brought up, which by the way, I you know probably agree with you on, still predicted that for uh, some strategic reasons from NATO expansion, the timing around that, and it's going to be too late uh, as Ukraine effectively was becoming integrated, at least partially into activities of the NATO, um, that it would be, uh, it would be difficult. So what's your take on what is, what is he missing? What is he getting right um, and because in some ways, some of your recommendations actually align reasonably well with uh, real politic kind of worldview of um, Mearsheimer and maybe even what Kissinger would have predicted. So I'd love to get your take on that if, if I'm reading it correctly or not. Yeah, I actually don't agree that Mearsheimer is uh, uh, in line anymore with real politic thinking. Uh, I actually debated him on this very issue of Ukraine invasion uh, a few months into the war. Uh, look, he's all about sort of monocausal um, uh, elements of the uh, driving this conflict. I, I don't believe that in either real life or, or in geopolitics that you have a single cause for anything. Life right. is way too complex. So um, I do not prescribe to the view that NATO expansion is the single and only cause of this conflict. I also don't believe that it has absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, I think it contributed to the overall desire for Putin to, to take um, Ukraine um, and both um, primarily um, not, th there's an element of seeing NATO as a threat, um, but more importantly, um, NATO represent NATO membership for Ukraine represented um, the foregoing of the chance to control Ukraine, which was right. really uh, at the heart of it. Right? If he was just only concerned about NATO being on Russia's borders, well, he has failed massively because you just had Finland join that has a huge border right. with with um, uh, with NATO, and he has not done anything to to um, um, to address that and and uh, and uh, you know, has not invaded Finland, of course. Uh, Sweden uh, obviously joined as well and and made sure that basically the Baltic Lake, uh, Baltic Sea is 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 a lake for NATO. Um, none of that is even registering a whole lot within Russia's political uh, 
uh, discourse. So it was not just NATO. Um, and it was, it was not even primarily NATO. It was a desire to control. It was a desire to control. It was Ukraine. the yeah. feeling of destiny and, and history that Ukraine was not a nation, that it belonged to Russia. Yeah. You know, completely false interpretation, of course. And uh, it was a uh, desire to... Uh, have Ukraine um, as part of Russia's power projection, um, particularly into Europe. And and I think uh, one of the things that I found really interesting, and and maybe you know we, we could deep dive into that, is while we actually fully agree with your you know kind of assessment, because I think it's too simplistic to say oh it's this one thing, or it's just he's just purely. You know, purely it's not purely ego because there is like as you said, there is a consideration from 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 geopolitical perspective, but it is, you know, m- complex issue. One of the things that you've highlighted in the book that you know struck me was the sort of the century of shame for China. Uh, and you know, you obviously have the same, you brought up some of the same empathy for, you know, Russia feeling vulnerable, being invaded through Ukraine multiple times in history. And we know that it is sort of embedded in the psyche and the education system you know, from at least Soviet era of like all these invasions and all the all these folks that are trying to attack us. So this is sort of a really deeply sensitive um, view. So you have this, uh, you bring up the sensitivity, so to speak, to the adversary, which is great. Um, how do you, we, um, how do we kind of build on that tradition to, you know, potentially de-escalate the situation that we have in Ukraine, and the kind of the thought that I have is um, uh, the the Kennedy speech uh, delivered at American University, well well known as the you know the the peace speech, right? And um, and it really was unique in a way that it um, connected American audience to appreciate that you may be adversary versus the Soviet Union, but you could still have certain things in common. You could still find mutually agreeable areas of interest. And it feels to me like this is very hard to do in our world. It's hard. We're struggling to do this sometimes internally. We're struggling to do this externally. You know, how would you approach this to, to that particular conflict and, you know, challenges around, uh, you know, resolving it right now that we all f- feel somewhat hopeless, I would say, um, in, in, in where we got, we are, where we are today. Yeah, I think our foreign policy since about President Carter's and and Brzezinski's days in the late 70s has become very moralistic, where we tend to see things as uh, good versus evil. And and look, there's certainly a number of evil regimes out there. Um, I I, I have no um, sympathy for Putin or Xi or Kim Jong-un or uh, Ayatollah Khamenei in in Iran. Um, They're absolutely evil, evil men. Uh, but, you know, if if you have that confrontation of good versus evil and you are not looking at the path to coexistence, potential coexistence um, with some of these countries, um, you're going to be fighting a lot of wars that are going to be quite devastating, right? And even Reagan, you know, in the 1980s, even as he called the Soviet Union the evil empire, of course, was engaging with Gorbachev and had numerous summits and, and arms control treaties and the like. So even he appreciated that uh, talking was important. Uh, look, I just wrote a piece for Foreign Affairs um, that talks about how Taiwan is really the new West Berlin. So it's interesting that you bring up Kennedy uh, because I think that was a very pivotal moment in his administration for the whole outcome of the Cold War. Uh, and it's not the Cuban Missile Crisis that everyone cites, uh, although it was certainly important, but it was actually a year prior, um, and it was the West Berlin Crisis. Uh, so Kennedy had come into office um, uh, intent on getting to a better relationship with Khrushchev and, and asking Khrushchev to have the summit that they would end up having in June of 1961 in Vienna, um, trying to come up to essentially an early detente with the Soviet Union and find a way to coexist. And uh, the summit was a total failure because Khrushchev pressed his advantage and basically insisted, as he had for the last few years, that Americans and other Western allies had to withdraw from West Berlin and that, uh, um, you know, the, the communist forces would, would essentially take over West Berlin. And Kennedy came out of that summit shook up, um, realizing that we were on a path to war. And in fact, he went on American television uh, in July of that that uh, that summer, 
and said that uh, said to the American people that we should be preparing for war, including nuclear war. Right. He had uh, told Congress that uh, he was asking for additional appropriations to identify um, fallout shelters across America to invest in more identification uh, of um, uh, early launch uh, capabilities from the Soviets and 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 the like. And uh, he also told the American public that we were going to fight potentially an existential conflict over this little space of territory uh, over 100 miles away from any uh, West German border that is West Berlin. And Khrushchev blinks. And uh, in August of uh, 1961, uh, Kennedy is woken up and he's told that this uh, East Germans on on orders from the Soviets were building the what would become the Berlin Wall. And it's interesting because the Berlin Wall, of course, became a symbol for everything that was evil about the Cold War and, and the Soviet Union and, and the Warsaw Pact. But at the time when Kennedy is told on the Saturday morning that uh, the wall is being built, um, or Sunday morning, I'm sorry, uh, he uh, celebrated it. Um, uh, he basically sighed in relief and said, thank God. Thank God he's building the wall. That means he's not invading. And that means that war is not going to be um, uh, very likely. And indeed, even though we had the Cuban Missile Crisis a year later, which was actually now growth of the West Berlin Crisis, post that period, post-1962, you had a great deal of stabilization in the relationship. The Cold War persisted, and of course you had Vietnam, in the 1970s, you have Afghanistan, all these proxy fights around the world. Uh, but the danger that America and the Soviet Union would get into a confrontation, including a nuclear one, diminished dramatically. And it allowed for the detente to emerge in the 1970s uh, with Kissinger and Nixon uh, going to Moscow and, and uh, uh, building a better relationship with, with Brezhnev. So what I argue in, the, in this piece is that Taiwan is that West Berlin uh, issue that is existential for China, I believe is really essential for America. And that if you remove that thorn from our side, you could get to a better relationship. It will not end the Cold War. There will still be this global competition for supremacy between China and the United States. Uh, but the chances that we would ever go to war over some artificial island in South China Sea or some rock in the East China Sea is basically nil. Um, but we could so go to war over here. Taiwan. Let's, let's pause here because I like just walk me through, you know, as less educated person than yourself on this topic, right? I haven't been to Taiwan and did all the, the, the work, but why would you consider West Berlin to be existential? Um, you mean Taiwan? It, or... ver, no, West Berlin in particular, oh. right? Because I think you're if you're making drawing that parallel that West Berlin is the the the, the best example. I, I to me, Cuban Cuban Missile Crisis feels a lot more existential from at least American point of view than West Berlin. Well, remember, a Cuban Missile Crisis was 13 days, and yes, that we were at high risk of war. I'm not trying to diminish the Cuban Missile Crisis, but that summer of 1961 was almost three months when the entire country was on edge and we were preparing for war. Uh, it was a lot longer and it was more intense um, than the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, Kennedy basically made the case that we had to make a stand in West Berlin, that this was critical to our credibility, um, that we had made commitments to West Berlin and the freedom of their people. And uh, we would not allow the Soviets to roll us on this and that it would be essential to the containment of further expansionism of communism and, and the, the Soviet influence uh, around Europe, that um, we had to make a stand. We we were not going to uh, force liberation of, of East uh, Eastern Europe, but we were not gonna let them take any more. Um, and that was the symbol of West Berlin uh, that was so critical to Kennedy and why he was willing to risk an existential nuclear conflict over this small piece of territory. Got it. So Taiwan, um, wh why do you believe this um, the, the the stand that we take right now will not lead to a confrontation if we are aggressively take that stand? I think that's part of your argument is if we are aggressive and we prevent um, uh, in the invasion, right? Like and make it very unattractive to to drive the invasion. 
then things somehow will stabilize, right? Well, they may not be pretty, there will be continued competition. But if we make a stand right now, and you know, in the next few years, it sounds like that's that's sort of the the most principal thing that we could do from from a policy perspective, right? And oh. then the competition will continue. But if, you know, if we miss this moment, then you know, either we have a bad escalation, um, uh, you know, during the crisis, right? Or um, you know, we start on the you know, United States starts going on the decline, and and you know, China may emerge as a uh, as a the next kind of superpower and um, and a leader, at least in, in Asian region, but potentially globally, right? So this is what you're saying is that precisely that Taiwan is this kind of the next few years in Taiwan is the moment of truth for Cold War Two. Yeah. So first of all, you, you, we have to talk about why Taiwan matters to us. Yeah. Right. And, and we have this very reductionist view in our political system and among the general populace that Taiwan really only matters to us because of chips that they manufacture. They're, of course, the powerhouse of manufacturing of chips. Ninety percent of advanced chips are, are in Taiwan. Uh, about 40 percent of uh, so-called foundational chips are, are being manufactured in Taiwan as well. Um, and that's really important. I don't want to under um, estimate the importance of chips to our digital economy. They're absolutely crucial. Um, you know, I like to say that uh, um, they're not the new oil as some people describe them because there are alternatives to oil. There are no alternatives to semiconductors or they're much more important than oil. But nevertheless, Taiwan is much more important to us than just chips. And it ha has always been that way. Um, mm. In fact, we have a long history with Taiwan um, going back to uh, even in 1950, General Douglas MacArthur called Formosa, as Taiwan was called at the time, the unsinkable aircraft carrier. And to understand its importance, you have to look at the map. And in the book, I have this map of China, which is a little bit different from the way that people typically look at the map of China. Uh, so typically you see this huge landmass okay. of China and this little speck of land next to it that Let's is Taiwan. Let's see if we can pull it up right now, your, your map. So it yeah. would be... Um, I think here, this is from the audible PDF that you have for the book. This is the right, this is the map that you're referring to. This is a map, uh, I wish yeah. they had done it in colors, but nevertheless, yeah. uh, you, yeah. you can see that Taiwan is really at that anchor point of the so-called first island chain. And if you're China and you're looking out at the world and this map really articulates it, you see yourself completely contained, right? From the yep. Eastern part, you you're facing the Korean peninsula. Uh, half of which South Korea is uh, an American ally with American bases, 28,000 American troops, um, radar installations, air bases, and the like. Then going further down, you have the Japanese islands where you have the headquarters of the 7th Fleet, Marines in Okinawa, enormous military capabilities there. Right in the center, you have Taiwan that is facing most of the Chinese ports um, across the Taiwan Strait and, and nearby in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, seen as an outpost of American power. And closing down that arc, you, you effectively have the Philippines, where once again, for the first time in 30 years, we have American military bases uh, uh, being established on that island, or at least existing Filipino bases being given um, access um, to, to American military. Um, and you also, Notice the waters, the waters on Chinese shores, both in East China Sea and South China Sea are very, very shallow. In fact, in the Taiwan yeah. Strait, they're about 300 feet. But right. if you go to the other side of Taiwan, um, to, to its eastern side, uh, they drop down to 12,000 feet. Uh, and the Pacific Ocean, of course, is the deepest ocean in the world. So why does it matter? Well, for China to become the world's greatest power, as they believe is their rightful place in the world, as they have been for much of their history, you know, for much of human history, um, they were the most populous country on the planet, the richest, the most powerful. And it's only in the last few hundred years since the dawn of the industrial revolution that first the Europeans and then later America eclipsed them uh, in that spot. And they see their rejuvenation as, as she calls it uh, really being able to take that rightful place as the world's greatest superpower. Well, if you're the world's greatest superpower, you can't allow yourself to be contained uh, by America and its allies uh, like you see on this map. And mm -hmm. in fact, the, the key 
to being a global superpower. That was true of the American power. That was true of the British power is naval power projection, right? You could trace the dawn of American rise in terms of our power to the early 1900s and Teddy Roosevelt sending the so-called great white fleet around the world to circumvent the world to announce that American power has arrived, that the rise of the US Navy to be able to traverse the world's ocean, to make them safe for commerce, uh, both for American consumers as well as to export uh, American goods to the rest of the world, really enabled us to to build up our power and uh, become the world's greatest superpower, eventually eclipsing um, uh, Great Britain. While China has similar ambitions, it is uh, investing a lot in shipbuilding capacity. It is now the world's greatest shipbuilder. It is investing in Blue Water Navy. It is about to launch its third aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. uh, but none of that matters if it can't escape its containment uh, right. in the East China and South China Sea. And right now, in order to traverse the world's oceans, they have to go through a few very small and largely controlled choke, choke points um, uh, controlled by U.S. allies and, and U.S. military. And you can't allow, you know, if you're the world's greatest power for that to happen. So taking Taiwan would allow them to escape that containment, build uh, naval bases on the east uh, shore of Taiwan, submarine bases, and effectively eject the U.S. out of the Western Pacific, push them all the way back to Hawaii and dominate that region. Not necessarily dominate in the sense that, you know, I don't believe that China is going to be on this massive Nazi Germany like march across Asia, you know, invading Philippines, invaded Japan. Uh, but they don't have to. Right. All you have to do is look at Russia and Russia's ability to project influence. And it's near abroad, whether it's Belarus, whether it's Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan and Central Asia or even the Caucasus with Armenia and even Georgia. In most of these cases, they don't even have to invade uh, these countries. Right. Simply yeah. being the big, powerful neighbor is enough to dictate the rules of trade, the rules of security order in their region. And that would be uh, China. And, and China's so if ability China to do takes that. over Taiwan, it's effectively saying, hey, there's a new sheriff in town. And it's going to be the new hegemon would, in yeah, the most yeah. important region of the world. Right. right this is right. where you have almost 50 percent of the world's GDP, most of the world's supply chains, most of the economic growth. So if you dominate that region, if you eject Americans out of that region, then you can use that as a power base to also project even more influence than they already do across the globe, whether it's Latin America, whether it's Africa, Europe, and so forth. And that will mean a decline of American power and uh, um, uh, ultimately uh, uh, security situation that's much worse for America, uh, greater potential to, to fight wars, and uh, ultimately an America that is less safe and uh, less economically secure, uh, lower growth rates and the like. So um, that Let's is why Taiwan matters to China and why it matters to the United States. Got it. But like one one thing that it would be great to extrapolate. Why do you believe there will be greater propensity to fight wars? Is it as they they balance each other out? The competition is more intense, right? You could argue during Cold War One, the fact that you know the America and the Soviet Union were reasonably close at times. Um, there was a sufficient deterrent from avoiding you know, direct wars. How do we think about that, you know, the more dangerous world that emerges from that? Well, look, an America that is not no longer able to enforce the global secure order that was established since 1945, uh, uh, since the end of World War II, um, is an America that uh, is uh, ultimately less secure because you will see more conflicts around the world, um, more dangerous regime uh, regimes propping up, more dictatorships, um, uh, more authoritarian regimes, uh, something that uh, China is absolutely trying to export around the world. In fact, just in recent years, they opened up a, a school in Africa for emerging African leaders to basically teach them how to build a surveillance state, how to build an authoritarian state. So they're trying to export their uh, ideology, not necessarily a communist ideology, but an authoritarian ideology authoritarian. Yeah. Uh, around the world. And, uh, you know, um, there is this theory in international relations that so far has been largely proven true that democracies don't fight other democracies. Um, so the more democracies you have out there, the, the safer uh, you will, uh, uh, the world will be because they'll be more accountable to their people and um, they'll find a way to address their problems in ways other than fighting wars and dictators, 
and authoritarian regimes don't necessarily have those types of political pressures and are much more likely to um, engage in a conflict. Um, and uh, if China is allowed to project uh, its power across the world, you'll see more and more authoritarian regimes and more likely conflicts arising in the world. So let's play it back from the Chinese perspective and like evaluate. Okay, so American foreign policy, you mentioned kind of since, um, you know, let's find a period, let's maybe like Korean War, Vietnam War. So like from from an outside perspective, right, from from, let's say, Chinese perspective, America during this, you know, quote unquote, peaceful uh, period, America has been actively involved uh, in enforcing you know, its set of policies, right? Like the end outcome has turned out great for America for, you know, for obvious reasons, winning the Cold War. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that coming back to that Kennedy perspective of how does China think about the world is something that will help us eventually find, like, is there, if there is a compromise, it will help us find it. And, you know, see which, which parts of American foreign policy, frankly, didn't work, right? Like, I think, you know, I would say out there, I, I was behind supporting the Iraq war and, you know, when it came out and then when I realized the impact of that, I was very disappointed that I misread uh, the tea leaves, misread the data and kind of followed the herd um, in that approach. So uh, as an entrepreneur, somebody who likes to think for, for himself, um, how do you kind of reconcile the fact that we obviously prefer to have America as the you know generally a nation that you know looks out for those in need um be the hegemon in the world but at the same time the world is you know is not it's pretty rare to have a single hegemon situation and then how do you reconcile the chinese worldview of what has been the role of america has it always been positive and you know you know you've listed a, a reason hundreds of reasons over hundreds of years of where China has been, you know, maybe felt like they've been promised things that didn't happen, right? And and so maybe they may not believe in the benevolence of the American foreign policy the same way you and I and me. Well, look, I, I don't actually necessarily agree that America has always had a benevolent foreign policy. We, we've certainly made mistakes and I criticize a lot our foreign policy over the last 30 plus years um, where we've uh, um, become uh, too, uh, 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 enamored with our hubris and 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 power, and uh, decided that we are going to be the world's policemen and, and fix problems all over the world. Um, I believe that was a great mistake. Iraq was a mistake. Um, staying in Afghanistan as long as we did, uh, I supported going in to address Al Qaeda, but then we had an inflation and expansion of goals, and suddenly it became about you know, uh, having girls go to school and building democracy in Afghanistan, something that was probably never attainable. And uh, ultimately, uh, we lost a lot of our uh, blood and treasure uh, for goals that um, uh, were were destined to failure. So um, uh, I, I don't believe necessarily that we are you know perfect and, and uh, the rest of the world should applaud any time we, we act around the world. Uh, but I still think we're better than China. And uh, to the extent that we have tried to promote democratic values, uh, free and fair trade and uh, human rights, um, that's largely, not always, but largely been good for the world. And um, you can't say the same thing about China. And uh, I think that um, we, we have to be much more constrained in, in our power projection, one, because we can no longer afford to do so. Um, but two, because it's not necessarily smart uh, to try to instill our systems on the rest of the world. I think we should lead by example as opposed to trying to, you know, enforce democracy on countries at a, at a uh, pointy end of a spear and uh, browbeat people uh, on these types of issues. Let them come to to their own conclusions about which systems is better. And, and look, um, I think we have a significant problem on our southern border in terms of uncontrolled migration um, that may pose security issues for us. But it is remarkable that so many people around the world, including from China, are coming across our border trying to find a better life for themselves and, and, and their children. Um, no one is doing that 
in 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 China, right? No one is jumping across the border to to live in China. It's it's quite the opposite. So we still are the attractive system, uh, the most innovative country in the world, and I think the world is better off with us being the, the world's greatest superpower versus China. That's, that's not to say we're perfect, right? So this this is the great nuance, and actually, you you brought me to one of the segments that I wanted to share, um, which is. There's a there's a there's famous long telegram from John Cannon. We got the original here. And I think towards the end, I'm going to see if I can find this chapter. He brought up something that you literally just stated, uh, which is um, um, this 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 kind of final articulation of, you know, yes, we should have this policy of containment. Uh, yes, we, we have these strategies. But first, let's also believe in ourselves. And I'll quote this. Finally, we must have the courage and self-confidence to cling to our own methods and conceptions of human society. After all, the greatest danger that can befall us in coping with the problem of Soviet communism is that we shall allow ourselves to become like those with whom we are coping. Um, and it it effectively what you like relates to what you're saying, which is. Hey, let's remember our strength, right? Like we have, you know, great technology innovation. We have, you know, great, uh, great education, great access to capital, right. um, the attractiveness of our country to allow for immigration. You know, it should be legal immigration. It should be merit based immigration. But nevertheless, we, we are attracting people from all over the world to come here. And that's just not the case uh, with China. We have the world's greatest alliances, the world's greatest military, the world's largest economy that is now very clear will likely never be eclipsed by China uh, because their growth has subsided. So we have enormous advantages. The book, you know, called World on the Brink, it's a very dire title, but it's actually very optimistic. Hopefully you, you found it. Yeah. So, Alex, because it talks about all the advantages that we have to to win the Cold War, Cold War II. Um, the big question mark that I don't address in the book is, do we have the political will? Oh, well, that, that's, that's a whole other debate. Uh, yeah, but like, that, let's, that's, that's let's, not something I, I wade into. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, but, but that's actually really interesting, right? Because the democracy, uh, has its own mechanisms and in, in generating that political will is tough. And I think what you've, you know, let's go, let's go back to why is China succeeding and Russia succeeding in attracting these dictators, uh, you know, in parts of Africa, right? And they're effectively country by country, and we're like French are being kicked out, you know, Russians are coming in. Um, and I think the, the sentiment that you've brought up is that there's a lot less moralizing, right? It's a lot more, you know, may, maybe pragmatic, maybe it's fr autocratic friendly, but l let's be transparent. America has had autocratic partners, uh, that were perhaps maybe anti-communist, but they were certainly not. You know, well, we have we have them yeah. today. Yeah, we right? have them and today. And they they start with letter S, and they're <laughs> very important, right? Like, but it's uh, but it is an interesting um, challenge, right? Like, because our strength is our moral conviction, you know, our kind of the way the way of life, right? And then it, it, it some seems to get in the way. And even though I think there is a there's now verbiage coming from our foreign policy establishment that, hey, you know, we'll, we're not going to be preachy. We're not going to be prescriptive. But in reality, it's, it feels like almost nobody's believing. Um, well, because we do. We continue to do this. Right. And, and you know, the Biden administration comes in and says we're going to have the summit of democracies yeah. and we're going to exclude countries like not just Saudi Arabia, which, you know, um, uh, one one can understand, but Singapore and Bangladesh and all these other countries that are, you know, not quite democracies, but also when you're doing that and you're saying we are in a fight of democracies versus authoritarians, and you're basically saying to all these other countries, go pick a side and it won't be ours, right? You're pushing right. them into the arms of China and Russia and others. And I think that's a huge mistake. Um, look, we got to work with the world as it is, not as we wish yeah. it to be. It would be nice if everyone was a democracy, but that's up to them. And there's nothing we can really do to to um, uh, make them change their government. Um, we've tried that uh, on a few occasions, uh, has been a miserable failure. Let's not do that again. And let's work with countries that are willing to help us in confronting uh, 
this new enemy that we have in, in this new Cold War, which is China, and uh, find ways to collaborate with, with them where we can, find ways to, to disagree with them where we must. Uh, but let's end this preachiness and moralization of our foreign policy that has not served us well. Great. So, so how do we find this empathy for the opponent, right? Like, is again, I I, I want to push on this because it's it's when you start using word like adversary, right? Which is the, you know, in the larger scheme of thing, it, you know, it is right. Like, how do we get back to that detente, right? That you're articulating because people get caught up in the words, right? Like, try to say. Well, let's find peace in Ukraine right now. And everybody is really escalated, right? Every like nobody wants to talk, think about that, right? And so it's gonna draw out, right? How do we avoid that happening? Right. And how do we bring a discourse that is sober minded about the challenges that are facing us? Right. But at the same time, does not, you know, get us in the hate mode, right? And and again, I wanna go back to um Kennedy, if you don't mind, right? And like this, to me, the this part of that uh, speech um, of um, uh, commencement address at the American University, uh, where, you know, I'll quote him, uh, on, where he compares the burden of the Soviet Union and the United States. And I'll just quote it, and, you know, I'd love to get your reaction, that we're both caught up in a vicious and dangerous cycle with suspicion on one side, breeding suspicion on the other side, and new weapons be getting counter weapons in the short, both United States and its allies and Soviet Union and its allies have a mutually deep interest in a just and genuine peace. And in holding the arms race agreements to this end are in the interests of Soviet Union as well as ours. And even the most hostile nations can be relied upon to accept and keep those treaty obligations and only those treaty obligations which are in their own interests. So let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. And blah, blah, blah. And then it says, we, you know, we breathe, all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures and we all are mortal. Um, so in the context of, you know, this brink, that we're getting getting to, particularly around Taiwan. And, you know, given the influential role that you see Kennedy has played in the Cold War one, how do we apply this thinking, right? This is a few years after all these crises to, to our policy decisions, right? Is this too early, right? Do we still need to have our, you know, this, cause this speech. Well, took we, place we, need, after we need a West new Berlin, Berlin wall, right? We, uh, yeah. and, and, you know, a metaphorical one, of course, uh, across the Taiwan Straits, that deters an invasion of uh, Taiwan by China. And notice that speech you just quote, which was a great speech, and I agree wholeheartedly with, with, with what he was saying, was in 1963, two years after two years. the um, uh, Berlin Wall was built, uh, a year after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And again, at that point, the risk of war has diminished dramatically, and we can afford to talk about arms control and understand the Soviets and the like. And, and look, for much of our official relations with China since 1979, when we officially recognized the PRC as, as, as a representative of China, we've had great relations with them, right? Um, because they were much weaker and they did not pose a threat to invading Taiwan. Now, I argue that we largely uh, uh, dropped our eye off the ball because they were militarizing for this opportunity while we were distracted with various crises, including the Middle East where you now are facing a situation where the balance of power is changing and they are now credibly threatening Taiwan, right? If you undo that and effectively restore that balance of power that has existed over the last 45 years and uh, prevent uh, uh, you know, the ability of China to unify with Taiwan by force, you can go back to the detente that we have right. had since 1979. You could have better relations. Now, I still think we, we're gonna have a lot of problems with China and we need to be much stronger on issues like IP theft, on issues like overcapacity, uh, unfair trade and the like, but we're not gonna go to war over any of these issues, right? The relationship will ebb and flow. By the way, we have trade um, disputes uh, that are quite vicious even with the European Union, right? We're not right. going to war with the European Union um, over them. Uh, but the difference right now is that we are on a path to what could be a very catastrophic war, 
We have to deter at all costs. Um, there are basically three possibilities here, right? The, mm -hmm. the Goldilocks possibility is that we deter conflict. China never invades. It realizes invasion is an impossibility. And we go back to being not friends, but, you know, still Cold War adversaries, but ones that are not on a path to war and that can cooperate in, in some areas and compete in others. Uh, or the two other options are that it launches an invasion and either wins or it loses. Um, and obviously, you know, in b both these scenarios, there's a question of does America fight or not? But I argue that in both of these circumstances, whether we fight or not, it's a disaster for the world. It mm -hmm. means uh, resurgence China. It means uh, uh, probably global depression in the case of war over Taiwan, probably $10 trillion wiped out in the first year. We have to avoid that that option at all costs. Uh, both and it's not options. great for China either. It's a lose lose is basically what you're you know saying, right? Because whatever the the outcome, the China trade will be you know also you know negatively affected. Even if um, even if they have you know achieved some sort of success, uh, the process uh, will be detrimental to the Chinese economic progress in the short term, at least. Is that is that accurate in your view? Well, it depends on how it goes, right? So, you know, Xi Jinping is going to be focused on two things. If he goes for this, he'll be focused on deterring America from intervening. Um, and he'll be focused on trying to take Taiwan as quickly as possible. So, you know, people talk about how the invasion of Ukraine by Putin was this terrible mistake that has ended up being much worse for Russia, certainly in, in the medium to long term. And that's true, but it could have easily gone the other way. If he had been able to capture Kiev in the first few days of that invasion, and by the way, it was very close. Um, mm. Most people don't appreciate how close it came. Uh, we would be talking here right now about Putin being the genius uh, and uh, being able to take Ukraine just like he took Crimea uh, in, a, in a very rapid fashion. That's the option that Xi Jinping is going to hope for. Um, you know whether he succeeds or not. Yeah, is is uh, you know remains to be seen. But if he does, um, that not that won't necessarily be bad for China, right? Because the rest of the yep. world will be very eager to move on yep. once Taiwan is taken, particularly once Russia, uh, China establishes themselves as a hegemon in the region and continue trading with them. So in this, like you you brought up that in the book does not address the issue of political will of the United States, right? And um, let let's explore it right now, right? A little bit. So there's obvious because that is the key question between you know now th three major conflict areas on the table, right? The the constant debates uh, about funding, the trade offs there we need to start making, right? And you were saying, hey, you know maybe these areas are not as important. Uh, this this Taiwan um, China Taiwan preemptive containment is what's important. Can we allocate resources here effectively? I, that's what I see, kind of the the book because in the larger scheme of things, that is the most important thing that we could be doing. And yet, there's you know the politics in the United States together with the economic pressures are uh, not looking very favorable. That you know this will be heated. You know, how do you influence our political uh, community, right, to 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 this threat, right? And effectively, this is, um, you know, we came from a, from a world where communications and propaganda in the Soviet Union was a very important part of the system, right? We could argue one of the reasons Cold War One was one was that America communicated about its way of life and made it more attractive. So communications. Right, and you writing this book is an important component of alerting um, all all stakeholders, right, from politics to kind of regular citizens that may be listening to this podcast to the, the situation. What's your take? You know, what's working there in breaking through the noise and driving that attention towards difficult, challenging things, whether it's going to the moon or fighting for Berlin Wall or defending Taiwan. Yeah. Well, look, uh, I don't address the political situation because th th that's not my job. I don't focus on politics. Um, uh, we work at Silverado on a bipartisan basis um, with uh, folks on both sides of the aisle. Um, the one hope I do have is that as divided as this town, Washington, D.C. is, the one issue that seems to be the uniting uh, 
force is China. And when you look at any of the progress that has been made in the last few years, particularly on Capitol Hill, whether it's the Chips and Science Act that has helped to um, restore um, the um, or or at least stall the decline of our semiconductor manufacturing industry, a really important bill uh, that was passed on a bipartisan basis, uh, primarily as an anti-China bill, as a way to deal with China, whether you look at the TikTok bill, uh, forcing the vesture of TikTok, right? So in a whole slew of these issues, uh, both Democrats and Republicans found common ground, even though they don't on pretty much anything else, because most uh, of of both parties realize that China is a threat, even if they don't want to call it a Cold War. So um, that gives me some hope. Uh, and, you know, the book articulates a strategy for, for winning this Cold War, for avoiding a hot war. And uh, I hope that uh, it's going to register both in the halls of Congress and in the, in the administration um, and really across America. So on that note, right, like so American thinking um, and American communications um, expertise has had a role in, you know, influencing Soviet um, Soviet population. Right. And we could talk about Radio Free Europe and, you know, other initiatives, books that were commissioned by CIA at some point about America had spread, had an impact. Um, it's not clear how much, but I think the, the way Soviet Union kind of un, got undone, you know, you could attribute some of that to a cultural failure of the Soviet system and the awareness that the American way of life was attractive. How much of that will be seen similar in this in this confrontation with China. And well, look, what will be the role I, of propaganda? I guess in particular, like whether whether it's good propaganda, quote unquote, or yeah, I, I I don't actually believe that that propaganda had much to do with the victory in the Cold War. I think that um, there were inherent um, contradictions in the Soviet system. Uh, particularly the the ethnic uh, tensions um, that you saw in places like Armenia and the Baltic states and Ukraine and others that no longer wanted to be ruled by Russians, right? And that's probably the big difference between the first Cold War and the second Cold War. You know, George Kennan, who he cited in that long telegram, his great insight was that the Soviet Union was this unnatural phenomena that would one day collapse and all we had to do was wait them out. Well, China is not collapsing. China is not going anywhere. It's been around for 5,000 years. It may be around for another 5,000 years. Uh, the Communist Party may live for a very long time uh, as much as it uh, disdains us. Uh, there's nothing we can do about that. So th the goal is not the disintegration um, of China. Um, and uh, I don't even define the victory as the fall of the CCP because if you define victory in that way, as some do, you may never have that victory. You may not have it for hundreds of years, right? Because there's nothing right. you can do to affect that. And in fact, you create more antagonism because they now see this as an existential conflict between you and them because you're trying to dislodge them from power. So ultimately, I think it's up to the Chinese people to decide what system they want to live under. Um, again, like we don't have to tell them about the brutality of the communist regime. They know it very well. Uh, we don't have to tell them about the attractiveness of our system. They know that very well too, That which is why you have 4,000 Chinese coming across our border every single month. Um, again, I don't welcome that necessarily because uh, we do need secure borders, but it, it does speak to the attractiveness of our system versus theirs. And um, uh, what I think we need to do is, again, focus on deterring conflict, focus on making sure that Taiwan's uh, status quo as this uh, autonomous, uh, um, effectively, nation remains and uh, then we can wait China out, not necessarily for collapse, but for the degradation of their economic advantages. Uh, you're already starting to see that, right? Their real economic growth is probably around two and a half percent, maybe three at the, at the most, which is very on par with ours. And of course, our economy is 25 percent bigger. So um, at that rate, they'll never catch up with us. Um, and um, that's before you even take into account the dramatic demographics changes that they're going to right. go under uh, um, over the, the the coming decades, uh, particularly in the in the late 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, you know, if you look at uh, the current projections, um, they are at 1.4 billion people roughly today. Uh, 
uh, very conservative projections state that they'll be at 550 million by the end of the, the, the century, a dramatic right. collapse in population that you've never seen in world history um, that will inevitably erode their economic power and, and their uh, as a result, their military power. So it will allow us to go back to this uneasy competition that we've had with them for the last 45 years where it is not existential, where we're not planning to go to war, but we're still the dominant economic and military power. And, and that's fine, um, right? Uh, it would be nice if the CCP collapses, but I'm not holding my breath for that. I love it because what you're fundamentally saying is the old truism in international relations that the opposite of war is not peace. The opposite of war is no war. And what your book, and I, if you don't mind, I'll just give it another plug here. Um, World on the Brink, How America Can Beat China in the Race to for the 21st Century. Your book, Dimitri, actually highlights that we have a path, and it's very important to get it right in the next few years, uh, to prevent the most risky element of where we could have a war with you know lots of human suffering. And so I hope um, all of you who are interested in uh, both getting excited about the what's great inside America, you know, your book is written by somebody who is who is a fan, you could see, and um, and kind of work on those strengths and build up those strengths and also be aware of the world, uh, you know, new changing world that we live in, take the right lessons from the past. So I really appreciate you taking the time to share that with us. Mitri, anything else people that are interested can do other than buying your book? Uh, yeah, check out my book uh, on Amazon or where I'll, wherever you buy books. Uh, also check out my podcast, uh, Geopolitics Decanted, where we dive on the, into those issues on a uh, roughly biweekly basis and, and cover conflicts like Ukraine, uh, like issues in Taiwan and, and elsewhere. So we didn't get into a solution to the problem in Ukraine, but I'm sure we could discover that on the pod on the podcast. If if you've yeah, got that's it. a Thank that's you. a really tough one. Uh, that's a tough things one. Are, things are not going well there. And and it's just, this is another reminder of why it's really important to avoid conflict, right? Like I think that's fundamentally what you're trying to do with the book. When you're going to, into that direct escalation, the um, the the peace process out of a war is way more complex and difficult than avoiding the war and um again i hope everybody gets a chance to read the book and support uh, the policy decisions that drive that thanks so much for joining us dimitri